in chat the um, toolkit again. You saw it in your email, but I'm just putting it here for a, a second peek. Hello, Amy. Welcome. We are very glad to have you here. We will do a full. Oh, you can't even hear me. I'm talking about you. It's all been good. Don't worry. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That was my chance. I could have been like, and Amy is, and told funny stories, like made up things. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will probably start on time. What we've seen throughout the day is um, we just ended a, a quick break that people tend to sneak in, but it's uh, maybe we'll give them one more minute and then we'll just start so that we can make sure to give you all the time that you need. And Cass, it's easier if I share and then we switch back and forth with the Mentimeters, right? Is that what we decided? I think so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. In fact, if you want to set yours up, we should, well, actually, I'll do this. So I'll do the introduction and then I'll, um, you can take over. Cool. But I'm excited for your Mentimeter, which does remind me, if you are in the audience, we are going to do Mentimeter again. So you've had your chance to do this before. It's actually the same Mentimeter that we had this morning. This will be a continuation of it. Um, if you have not done Mentimeter before, don't worry, you're going to see some slides and I'll put it in chat so you'll know what to go to. It'll be www.menti.com and then we'll use the same code we used before, which we'll put in chat and it will also be on your screen. But I do recommend that you have your phone next to you because that is my preferred way to do Mentimeter when I'm in the audience is to kind of watch what's happening on the screen and then be answering the questions with my phone. Oh, perfect. Amy also just put into chat the link for the AISP toolkit, so you can just save that link um, and use that as well. Well, let's get started. So earlier today, we had the community learning through data-driven discovery, where we talked about how do we meet and work with communities. Um, and throughout that process, we really tried to focus on where do people address bias and equity when they work with stakeholders? And I think we get really used to this idea that people have biases and we need to work around that. But one of the things that um, we have recognized for a long time, but I think is becoming more and more important in the work that we do, is recognizing that those biases that he, people have get imprinted into the data that they create, into the questions that they ask, into the models that they run. Um, and some of the work that we see here from Dr. Han Nelson is about how this structural racism and discrimination has been has been built up and perpetuated in some of our data systems and what can we do to try and address this in our work you know and i think about what is the message that the timely message of our year and of our era for undergraduates postdocs and young scholars i think understanding racial equity and data is of critical importance so i'm very very glad to have the audience members here and i'm also very glad to have dr han nelson here so let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Amy is a research faculty and director of training and technical assistance for Actional Intelligence for Social Policy, uh, which the acronym is AISP. You're gonna hear that several times throughout today. Um, and it is an initiative by the University of Pennsylvania that helps state and local governments collaborate and responsibly use data to improve lives. Prior to joining AISP in 2017, Dr. Han Nelson directed the Institute for Social Capital at UNC Charlotte um, and was charged with supporting data informed decision making in the Charlotte region. Previously, she served as a teacher and school leader. She's a community engaged researcher and has presented and written extensively on data integration and intersectional topics related to educational equality. Amy has at the end, you know, she'll talk about some of the where you can find more information. But if you Google her, you will find many interesting interviews and podcasts on this issue, and I encourage you to listen to them. They are worth your time, and they are a lot of fun. So we could not be more thrilled to have Dr. Han Nelson with us today. I will stop sharing my screen so she'll have a chance to share. As always, um, if you've been here throughout the day, you know, just put your questions in chat. When appropriate, we will even stop what's going on in the session and say, oh, we have this really important question. Um, otherwise, we'll keep it for Q&A at the end. But we would love to hear your thoughts. And so please, please engage. We'd love to hear it. Oh, wait, 
I cannot hear you, but I can see your screen. Excellent. All right. Unmuting myself would be helpful. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Juan Nelson, and um, thank you for the introduction, Cass. Uh, it's lovely to be with you today. Um, so I'm here to talk about two topics that don't often intersect. Um, they are two topics that you could study every day, all day long, and never achieve full competency on either. Um, so you will never like reach the pinnacle of achievement on understanding racial equity, and you will never fully understand administrative data reuse because they are both entire fields that um, are growing and expanding at exponential rates. And um, so our work, right, you know, that I'm presenting today is around the intersection of those two things. And so everything I'm talking to you about today is a practice. It is not a perfect. Um, we don't pretend to know everything we're doing <laughs> and we are um, as in all things integrated data definitely building as we walk right um, so with that caveat i will continue all right so first just to frame out kind of who we are and why i'm talking to you today about this so um, aisp is um, as Cass said we're a small initiative out of the university of pennsylvania school of social policy and practice um, we are a lot of things to a lot of people but it, we are tiny there are like four or five of us depending on how you count us and um but we are we don't hold data that's a often a thing that people assume about us that it's not the case um we don't like to recommend vendors or any of those things we're not focused on academic research even though we are based out of a university um, our main focus is around ethical use of data and so that includes a lot of things like data governance that includes things like racial equity, because you cannot have ethical use of data without thinking about equity issues, particularly racial equity. Um, and we do a lot of connecting, convening. Um, you know, I, I, I describe my work as like part data sharing therapy, part, you know, cat herder. Um, and we are data evangelists. Like we strongly believe in the power that data has to do good, um, but there are a lot of like buts around that um, because data can also be very harmful as we all know here. So we run um, a peer network. That is one of the ways that I get to hang out with Heather and Cass quite often. Um, we run a network of sites across the United States that are focused on cross-sector data integration. Um, we develop lots of guidance documents and standards. One of those things is the toolkit that you've seen. Um, we also have a really great parallel document that I will drop into the chat in a minute um, around an, our introduction to data sharing. Um, we do a lot of technical assistance. I work with a lot of sites. Um, I have been across the United States today in the amount of sites I've talked with. <laughs> so um, a typical day for me will be talking to you know six, seven sites. Um, today I have convened a group in Connecticut. I have talked to two groups in North Carolina and a group in Seattle. I think there was one more um, that I've probably blocked out. I've had two a lot of Zoom today in my life. Um, oh yeah, a bunch of uh, legal experts for public human service agency. So that's like a typical day for me is talking to folks around the US. Um, so a lot of consulting, training, a lot of advocacy, especially at the federal and state level, um, and then actionable research. So when we say actionable, what do we mean by that, right? So when we think about data sharing and data integration, we kind of have three buckets. So legal, ethical, good idea. We see legal as the bottom bar, like we don't even talk about it if it's not legal and believe it or not, a lot of things, most things are legal. Like if, if data use is illegal, then you have a lot of other problems besides the legal bar. Um, ethical is, you know, is a very gray area. What's ethical to me may not be to you and so on, right? So we think a lot about situational and like contextual, ethical, <laughs> you know, permissible, those things. Um, and then a good idea. So if, um, if analysis can't be used to improve the life of residents in our opinion it's probably not a great idea um, and there's probably not a great um, not a lot of reason to do it with administrative data because there are a lot of data uses that can be actionable and can improve the lives of individuals um, so when we see legal ethical good idea that all means um, actionable research all right so here's our network 
um, as you can see, Iowa's here, um, and we have a lot of um, both established sites and then developing sites, so sites that are working to get cross-sector data integration going. And I'm realizing that this is an old map, so don't pay attention to that map. It is incorrect. Um, <laughs> I clearly pulled an old one. Sorry about that. Um, the other important thing to know about AISP is our approach is, is quite different from other folks. We don't center the data. We center the people always. Um, our, we strongly believe that data flows at the speed of trust and data sharing is as relational as it is technical. So um, we think a lot about people. So that means we do a lot around staffing and we do a lot around, um, you know, thinking about that part of the work rather than just looking at, you know, what's on a screen in front of us. All right. Oh, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Cass now to do our first Mentimeter. We have a couple of these, so part of the transition, but it'll be fine. It is gonna be really fun. So yeah. in chat, I put the code, you go to www.menti.com, and then you're gonna put in code 9811-0697. Now, I recognize most of your faces from this morning, so I know you've done this before. <laughs> Keep doing it, this is fun, and it's also anonymous. But here are three important questions to kind of think, you know, that we're going to ground ourselves in for this. Um, and Amy, you, do you want yeah. to talk through these? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the first one is, so these are three questions that I like to ask, um, you know, so how comfortable are you with the concepts around administrative data reuse? As I mentioned in the beginning, um, these are two topics that are that typically don't intersect where you could study all day, work all day and never achieve full competency. They're they're tough, they're hairy, they're shifting. Um, but how comfortable you are with them. So. Uh, all right. Great. And then the next question is, how comfortable are you with concepts related to racial equity? Um, I did a presentation this morning where someone literally put in the chat, what is racial equity? <laughs> like. Great question. Um, we do define it in the toolkit. Um, so I encourage you to look at it there. But that's like clearly that person is um, on the beginning stages of comfort, right? Um, if you're if you're defining. So um, this is a question that I've learned to ask because all of us have different lived experience around this and different knowledge. So and that all contributes to comfort. All right, and then the next question is how comfortable are you in being uncomfortable because race is a concept that is challenging right. Um, we typically don't talk about race, um, especially not in um, in a lot of professional work settings it's a topic that um, most folks shy away from and most cultures of organizational culture shy away from um, and it depends on you know kind of where you grew up um, and where you live and, and all those things so. Um, you will, might be uncomfortable today, and I'm just here to say that that's all right. So, let's see, looks like we've got a few more people to respond. Great. And for all of these, um, I'm going to drop in the chat with number two. I'm sorry, with number one, the concepts around um, administrative data reuse. This is a, a document that will help with that. If you are in the mid range or in the lower range of that one, um, this is an intro document that is a parallel document to the toolkit. Um, and the reason why we created that is because we we convene a group of people, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And so what we had is we had some like really nuanced data users and we had people that had been reusing administrative data for decades. And then we had these community organizers who were very versed on like racial equity and on inequitable data use, but didn't understand the protections that were inherent to administrative data reuse. Um, and so we had to figure out a way to like, there were a million resources to get people to understand racial equity. But there was nothing <laughs> to get people to understand what we meant when we said data governance. Um, and so we were like, oh, crap, we're gonna have to make another document. So we did it. Um, so it's a parallel document <laughs> to the toolkit. Um, and that's what I just dropped in the chat. Um, so that should help you with number one. Cool. All right, those are good numbers. I think we can move on. Go ahead and share my screen again. All right, so here we go. This is the document that we will be talking about today. Um, 
And again, um, check out the chat and it should be in there. So just a note about process. Um, we did a lot to make sure that we had a good process around this. As you can imagine, um, we were, again, no one has competency around this. Um, <laughs> so we were like, what are we doing? We don't know what we're doing. So we're just gonna invite people, a lot of different voices in to check us, to, to point out that we don't know what we're doing and try to figure it out. So that's what we did. Um, first, we acknowledged the need that we needed to, to do this work. Then we figured out funding, which took a while. We did pay participants to sit in the work group, and, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we've been writing and then disseminating. Um, and now we're in this like learn and shift phase of the work, um, trying to support sites who are trying to do the work, which is hard. All right, another quick note before we go any further. Um, one of the most important things that we can do um, in thinking about this work is to move to a race explicit frame, right? So think about these three options, right? Um, and anything you do, you can be race explicit, you can be race neutral, or you can be race silent. Um, there, if you need more information about this, there's a hyperlink here in these slides, and I'm sure these slides will be available to everyone. Um, there's a great report here by Race Forward. Um, they're the group that supports the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. Um, which we draw on heavily in the toolkit, and they were um, a part of our work group. So in this work, we will be race explicit. Um, and uh, I do think that that's an, a really important first step. So if you would like to learn more about that, I would encourage you to do so. All right, toolkit development. So essentially, we spent months figuring out who we should invite to be a part of this work group to develop the toolkit. We invited um, every a range of folks. So we had folks who had been using administrative data for 30 years in a government agency, um, a couple of those in very conservative political environments. And then we pulled in people very intentionally who had blown up data sharing efforts in their own communities. Um, we have we you know had a few folks who would self-identify as um, as kind of radical. I don't, I don't think I call them radical, but like they definitely had been called radical by people. <laughs> so we had these like community organizers who had blown up data integration efforts. And when I say blow up, like they literally fought um, against government agencies for using data in particular ways. Um, and side note, I agreed with their perspective and agreed that those efforts should not um, continue as they were. So. We invited these people into a work group activity. We essentially locked them in rooms with lots of coffee and uh, muffins, and then um, had a lot of chart paper, a lot of markers, a lot of post-it notes. This is obviously pre-COVID, and um, said, we're, we don't agree on these things, but we gotta get to a point where we can all be okay with them. So we, um, we did that. It took a while, about a year, um, a whole lot of Zoom, uh, two um, two day in person sessions again with a lot of coffee and a lot of muffins and um, and a lot of Google Docs like when I finished this thing I never wanted to look at a Google Doc again so a lot of collaborative editing um, so we also had site based contributors so one of the things we really wanted to focus on was that this is all work in action no one has this figured out and so we we contacted a bunch of um, communities who were doing we thought doing some exemplar work and they were like, no, 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 don't call us exemplars. We don't know what we're doing. This is just a first step. So we call this um, in the toolkit, it's called work in action. And so we had sites that contributed like actual lessons learned um, on the ground. So, you know, our current moment is a little complicated. Um, I mean, this is a big data conference, right? Um, so there is data, right? We are data rich and insights poor as uh, a lot of people describe it. So having all this data is certainly an improvement on what we used to have. Um, and it's certainly an improvement on the way we historically have made decisions, which is completely you know, without data at all or with like very poor data or limited data. So, so, it, so it's an improvement, but it's a long way to go, right? Because we know that a lot of these big data are problematic, right? They're not um, reflective of lived experience, they have no context to them, right? And, and data don't speak for themselves. Um, they're not great at distinguishing correlation versus causation. And typically we are functioning with a series of proxies. We don't use real constructs um, because we can't, because this is reuse of data, right? We're not um, doing original primary data collection. 
So it is not a measurement of what matters most. It's usually like, you know, this is as, as close as we come to what matters most, which is, you know, a challenge. So this is the way we frame out the work of this toolkit, right? So um, we have work to do, right? Just, and it's, it's, it is infrastructure work. It is not necessarily fun. It is not, I mean, people like us think it's fun, but normal people don't think it's fun. Um, it is not exciting work. It is not usually easily funded work, but for us to really move forward in an equitable way, we have to think about this as infrastructure. So similar to, you know, the, the um, railroads of the 1800s, the highways of the 1900s, data infrastructure is our century's infrastructure project. And so we have to fund it properly. We have to think about it in ways that doesn't decimate communities as we know our previous century um, infrastructure projects did. So context is key. And we talk a lot about that within the toolkit. All right, so the next part of this is where do we need to center racial equity? This is the data life cycle. This will not be a new graphic for anyone on this call. Um, hopefully, I'm assuming it is not new to anyone. So this is the data life cycle. And there are lots of different ways to portray the data life cycle. This is just one. It was a simplistic one and one that worked for our purposes. So the question is, where do we center racial equity? And the answer is everywhere. Um, there is not one part of the data life cycle where you do this, you do it at every part, which is hard um, and necessary. All right, so I'm gonna roll through these. These are things that we strongly encourage. These are things we discourage. Um, we try to never say never in our world because every time I say never, I end up eating those words because again, these are developing fields um, and we really don't know. Um, so notice we don't say we strongly discourage because we just discourage. Um, we tried to use a lot of moderating language on this, um, but we do have some opinions on here and that's what this slide is. Um, this right here is a key concept in our work. We think a lot about mitigating risk. So just like um, you have to be race explicit, you also have to be risk explicit. There is risk with every single type of data use. To say that there is no risk to something is not accurate, especially as everyone on this call knows, um, you know, we know that we can re-identify data fairly easily in, in ways that we never could have imagined even five years ago, right? So there is risk in any kind of data sharing and integration, but that risk varies tremendously. So we think a lot about benefit versus risk. So here you have, you know, High, high benefit, low risk, that's a green, right? Green light. And then you have high risk, low benefit, red, right? Red doesn't mean stop necessarily. It means like slow down, stop, reevaluate, and maybe go forward and maybe not. Um, so this more just means like you're gonna need a lot of governance and a lot of discernment around these use cases. Um, the other thing I'll say about this graphic is that this is very contextual. So what is green in my community may not be green in your community and vice versa. Um, so this is incredibly um, specific, not only to the location, um, but also to the populations that you're, that you're talking about. So it's, it's highly contextualized. All right, this is another slide that's an important part of what we think of racial equity. So, we're all familiar with open data. Restricted data is mainly what AISP does. We think about data that can be used um, if you are the right user asking the right question in the right context, right? So it is restricted. And then unavailable data is a, can be a couple of different things. It can be um, just literally data that doesn't exist, or it could be data that is of such poor quality, it should not be used for anything, which I'm sure none of you have ever encountered data like that, right? Um, or it could be data that the risk is so great that for whatever reason, um, a community or an agency decides it's just unavailable. So a good simple example of that in some places is domestic violence data. Um, that data, there's such a high risk associated with use that um, it would take a very special use case with a lot of protections to make the risk, um, the benefit outweigh the risk. Um, all right, and, and this is um, 
the reason why this is a center a central part of racial equity is a lot of open data is highly racialized data so for example in my community if you were to search my family and my children and myself and my husband we are all white middle class upper middle class you know um folks in a southern state and if you were to search us you would find us in some publicly available data sets like you would see my kids and their birth record short firm form you would see my husband and i in voter registration but those things are not going to be um, highly racialized right but there is a lot of data that is highly racialized like tax data in our place if you have any kind of outstanding tax bill that data is highly racialized um, corrections data uh, police department data um, you know, there's a range of data sources that are highly racialized. Um, and frankly, my family, we aren't in those data. Um, and so for that reason, when thinking about open data, it's very, very important to consider racial equity and disparate impact. Um, and so we do, we do go into that quite a bit in the toolkit. All right, next Mentimeter, I will stop sharing. So this is a question about your favorite data set um, or what type of data do you typically use in your work? So do you typically use open data or do you typically use restricted data? So data that ha you have to have some kind of use agreement around it. That might be a data sharing agreement, might be an MOU, um, might be a data use license There are a lot of names for different legal agreements. Okay, it's a good mix. Great. And it's probably a combination too. Um, in my former life, um, in my former role, we did a lot of combination. We would use um, restricted data um, to answer certain questions and then we would contextualize that with open data. So it can often be a combination depending on your what questions you're talking about. Great. All right, Cass, you want to go to the next one? Just looking at the time. Yeah. And here, like, what's your favorite data set? Everyone has their favorite data set to muck about in. I really love to look at um, I really love to look at school level data. That's a lot of my research. That's my favorite data set to muck about in school level analytics. Um, okay, great. And there's a question in the chat around what do you mean by racialized data? So um, a lot of data does have race and ethnicity in it, um, but some data is disproportionately racialized, meaning that the data set is majority black and brown people in the data versus white people. So um, Racialized means there is um, disparate, usually disparate impact or um, disparate um, effect by that data. So for example, I'll give you another example of a highly racialized data set, um, school quality scores. So if you look at those like great school metrics, if a school is a D or an F, it is almost surely in, in most states a uh, school filled with black and brown children. That is a highly racialized data set. And some data sets are like that and some are not. Um, so it's important to think about with, especially with open data. All right, excellent. All right, Cass, do you just wanna roll through the deck from here and I won't, I don't need to share again. Or do you have the full deck or I can share whatever is easier? Okay. I am getting close to being done. Um, actually, you know what? I'll just share because that way, oh, never mind. You're up. <laughs> I'll share that way because I'm going to roll through these pretty quick. Okay. So, in light of time, because we're going to have lots of other time to talk. Um, just wanted to walk you through the components of the toolkit a little bit more. So with each one of these six stages of the data life cycle, there's um, examples from each. So there's positive practice and problematic practice listed for each. Um, here's just examples 
Um, there's also work in action for each of these. So there's a short form that's on the left, and then there's a long form for those of you who love, you know, appendix reading, which I know I'm probably, there's probably a group of you in that, in this, in this uh, presentation. Um, there are also activities for walking just organizations through this work um, because thinking about racial equity is very individual focused and then it's also organizational focused right we can have um, really interesting organizational habits when it comes to race so these can be helpful and then you add in collaborative you know like data hubs data collaboratives across organizations and then it gets really interesting around race amy so, can i pause yeah. you on that for just a second Please. I'm going back yeah. So we had some questions this morning about how do you engage stakeholders and what sort of tools do you use? So I just yeah. want to pause everyone and say, here are some great examples yeah. that um, stake. The one on the bottom right is one that I've used and really like. I mean, many of these are super helpful. And Amy has pulled together some really great tools in here. So if you are one of those people and I can see by the participants here that some of you are the ones who asked this question, um, this is a great, this is a great helpful answer for you. Okay, thanks, Amy. Yeah, and there are also some checklists that I would start with um, that are a part of it. There's like a get, there's literally a thing in the toolkit that says like getting started, start there. Um, <laughs> because it's really helpful. I mean, they're really great questions. So we didn't create a lot of these things. We just more did a very broad scan and said like, Q's already got really great tools that we can repurpose for this. And, and that's a lot of what the toolkit is, is drawing attention to resources that we find really helpful. Okay, so here's the biggest takeaway. If you if you hear nothing else that I say today, um, this is the biggest, the big picture thing, right? There is something for everyone to do. Um, whether you are someone who enters work uh, or enters data, um, if you are like a caseworker and you are literally entering in data, then that is something free to do around racial equity. If you're an analyst, data scientist, of course, um, executive leader, like there is something for everyone to do here um, to move us forward. All right, I'm gonna get, we're gonna get our last Mentimeter. I will stop sharing. All right, so what is one thing, like what's a sticky thought you had or like a concept that you wanna learn more about or a resource you need? Um, what is, what is one thing that you are marinating on right now or like something that you're gonna think more about later? Great. Yeah, and I love, you know, it's funny, I, I don't think I use the word qualitative this whole presentation. Um, I am a qualitative researcher, a lot of my work is qualitative, and then I do a lot of mixed methods, um, which surprises a lot of people because I deal with data systems all day. Um, <laughs> but I do think that my training as a qualitative researcher really helps here. And I do think you need both. Um, it's really hard to do um, highly contextualized analytics without some kind of qualitative piece. Um, the other thing I didn't mention, which would be a miss with this audience, is the importance of metadata with racial equity. Um, it's really, really important to know how data are collected. So for example, I'll give you some real life examples real quick. Um, my in my community, we were using we were doing like an evaluation of a reentry program, and um, we were seeing very weird things with race data from our sheriff's office. And we found out through a series of questions and discussions um, that they don't really collect self-report at the time. 
they did not collect self-reported data. So all the race and ethnicity data was phenotype. So it was like what I see when I look at you. Um, so like, oh, there's Amy, this person that I'm booking into the jail right now. She is a white lady. I'm going to classify her as white non-Hispanic, right? In my case, my phenotype is accurate, but the broad majority of people in my community, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. We are a Latino hypergrowth area. We have a tremendous um, diversity of folks here and a lot of multiracial individuals. Um, so as you can guess, they were really wrong um, with phenotype, <laughs> the way people look. So the race ethnicity data was so bad, we had to delete all of it. Um, so I'll give you another similar example, same data set, um, similar study, not the same exact study. Um, I looked at the data set for the first time and said, uh, where are the women in the data set? And everyone said, what are you talking about is like there are no women in the status that I know there are women in jail like I, I see them um, <laughs> like what I don't understand this data I was the first woman who had ever looked at the data no one had noticed yeah kind of bananas right um, and I wasn't even looking at individual data I was looking at metadata I was looking at like um, they literally ran just like cross tabs on some things um, and no one had noticed. So another good example of the importance of metadata and the importance of staffing. Because um, obviously it had been, before I looked at that data, it had all been men. We look for different things depending on our identity. All right, these are great answers, I love it. Um, I'm gonna wrap up, I'm realizing I am a few minutes over. I'm gonna just share my last few slides here. Um, so next steps, these are like AISP's next steps. Uh, you can make your own next steps list because there's lots to do for all of us. Um, other thing, if you have feedback, once you dig through the toolkit, we would love feedback. Um, we do collect that through a Qualtrics form because we're already working on a version 2.0 of the toolkit. This is not readable and I know that. Um, <laughs> this is because these slides will be available to you. This is like everything you'd want to know. There's a podcast, there's a panel presentation, there's webinars, there's all kinds of things to the gift of COVID. Everything has been digitized and is available online and for free. Um, so all that's there. Uh, and then here are the bit.ly's again and my email. If you have any questions, I'm always happy to talk to people and um, I I'm going to wrap up. Sorry for going a little over. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Amy. That was really great. And we are excited that you are going to stay and join us in a panel discussion after our next chat. So I am so thrilled to introduce the next two folks who are close partners of mine. Um, we have Heather Rouse and Todd Abraham thinking about, OK, now you know, Amy is this national thought leader on racial equity and data, especially around administrative data. And then Heather and Todd have been putting this into action and get to give us hands on experience. What's going on in Iowa? How do we think about taking this toolkit and these ideas and actually putting putting this into real life here and with the people we know and the communities and the data that affect us. So this is a really fun opportunity to hear about what's happening here at Isla, and I, and I want to start by just giving a little bit of the background of the people that you'll listen to. So Dr. Heather Rouse is an associate professor of human development. Your bios might say assistant, but recently tenured uh, associate professor of human development and family studies at Iowa State. She directs I2D2. Um, which is the Iowa's Integrated Administrative Data for Decision Making. And she specializes in research impacting child and family policy, including early childhood education, child welfare and homelessness, access to healthcare, and has nearly two decades of experience studying and developing integrated data systems for policy and research. She's a representative on the National ECIDS Leadership Work Group on Stakeholder Engagement and the work of I2D2 with me has been nationally recognized in the Health Research Services Administration Community of Practice Data Sharing and Use Home Visiting Program. Heather, though, what you need to know about her is a woman with a vision and with a passion. So she started this work when she was doing her graduate work um, at UPenn. And then she took that on into her first, her first part of her career working with administrative data in more of a 
hospital clinical medical work and then she came here and she came with one goal and that was to build an integrated administrative data system in Iowa and I was with Heather in many of those early meetings and no one thought it could be done and she is one of the most determined people I have ever met and it is with great joy that I say it is done and Heather has the strong passion and leadership to direct this work for years so we're so grateful for her and the work she's done for Iowa we're excited to hear her but I'd be remiss not to talk about our other fantastic colleague, Todd Abraham, who is also here today. He is the Assistant Director of Data and Analytics at ITD2, and he focuses on the interplay between individual differences, personal life event experiences, and contextual environmental factors that influence psychological and physical well-being. He is an expert at data ingestion um, and includes assessment of data quality, data cleaning strategies, and linkage methods. Is a career long interest in the rapid transformation and dissemination of existing data into actionable information for successful use by agencies, policymakers, and citizens to improve the lives of individual families within their communities. And Todd, the little thing you might not know is boy, we heavily recruited this man. He is so great at learning new things and adapting, and not only like figuring it out, but moving it forward. So when we started our integrated data system work, we had a really good plan. We had like a leading national expert help us develop it. And over the last 18 months, Todd has made it even better to the point that now that expert is reaching out and saying, Todd, how do I do this work? So, so glad to have Todd here and happy to hear what Heather and Todd have to teach us about Iowa. Thanks, Cass. Um, wonderful uh, explanation. Some, some would say, um, Dedication is a good word. Some would also say just really bullheaded. So either one is fine. Um, yeah, we'll take those. Um, this was just something that had to happen. You know, you think about, and, and I know Amy took a little more time and I was, the whole time I'm sitting here going, Amy, keep talking, keep talking. Like, this is really good stuff. Um, because the value of these integrated data systems is just woefully underestimated. I mean, the ability to understand what's happening across systems you know, data sit in silos and they're useless. Um, well, not useless, but not as useful, let's put it that way. Um, but being able to understand what's happening, especially when you talk about early childhood, and that's why um, this was just a, such an important passion for us, for the state of Iowa to, to build. Um, and so that's where it started. So I'm gonna share, Cass asked me to share a little bit about our development and governance approach um, because you know Amy kind of talked a little bit about all the different phases where you can consider equity and how you build that into your growth and something that has been so important to us in building our Iowa system has been having a really strong data governance structure so having the right people at the table to develop the questions ask the questions create the data sets even figure out which data sets are going in um, has really been central to our being able to even think about racial equity because we have the right people at the table within those systems where the data are coming from. So um, let me pull up my slides here and share my screen and get us started. Um, and essentially what we're gonna do here today, I'm gonna share for just maybe 10 minutes. Um, that's what I'm shooting for, 10 minutes, and then uh, hand it over to Todd to share with you a lot more of the data details. So get into some of the nitty gritty of this. Um, so Iowa's integrated data system for decision-making, um, affectionately called I2D2, is a state university partnership that really reflects a shared governance model that has invested stakeholders at all stages of the process. So one of the things that we talk about and one of the things that Amy introduced, you know, was having, you wanna talk about equity, you need to talk about it at all phases, right? Data collection, even just thinking about what data you have and, and why you wanna ask the questions. And so one of the things that's really essential to our process is having those stakeholders included at all phases. Um, and our system has evolved and really centralized stakeholder driven priorities, right? So that <clears throat> our research questions are not asked unless it's something that our stakeholders have said that they want asked. So here's our vision. And this, we've probably spent the first year of our development on this. Um, one of the things we learned from, a phrase we learned from AISP was go slow to go fast. And we really took that to heart. We spent a lot of time in meetings and talking before we had a computer. We didn't even buy a computer, like a computer. We didn't buy a computer 
computer until like a year and a half in. Um, we didn't talk about legal agreements until a year and a half in. We focused on vision. What is the vision of your system and why do you want to build it? And that was so important because now this is something that's really um, infused across our stakeholders. They know that this system, with all due respect, it wasn't built for academic publications to sit in a library, right? It was built to be used. It was built to be driven and support state priorities. And so that was something that was really important. It was built from a vision of an early childhood coordinated set of systems and services. So that's, that really drives all of our work to make sure that's happening. And speaking of early childhood, my children have just come home from school, which you can hear. So we love COVID and working from home. Those are my lovely children that you're hearing in the background. Um, I2D2 essentially sets up a system where we bring data in. We have complicated algorithms for integration that Todd's gonna talk about here in a minute. We spend a lot of time in dialogue to really understand what the data mean. So we don't wait to talk with people when we're done. We talk with people as we're integrating. We talk with people as we're summarizing descriptive data elements. We talk with people as we're figuring out which outliers to drop and which ones to keep in. And then we use those data and those discussions to inform decision making. And then the cycle continues. The idea is that we have built a system where we can then continue to look at those data and see what the efforts, what the results of that decision making um, can support. Um, I didn't put years on this, but uh, almost paralleling the timeline that Amy shared from 2017 through to now, um, we really spent a lot of time in stakeholder engagement. We had a director appointed task force with representatives from each of the different agencies to help us really formulate the plan, identifying the systems. We spent a lot of time meeting with data and policy people. Okay, so here's one of the, one of the key things that I love about the AISP toolkit that had not been developed when we did this, by the way. So it's kind of fun to see when parallel play happens and then it all comes together and it makes sense in the end, right? But we did this traveling show where we talked to people and said, well, what data do you have and how is it collected? And wait, you don't collect race data? Oh, you collect it this way? Why do you collect it that way? Well, why don't you ask this question? Do you ask the question or do you look at people and write it down, right? So we had some of those conversations in the beginning to collect our metadata before we even started collecting data. We collected the metadata first. And then we developed project specific data sharing agreements. We worked on our governance approach and then we actually started integrating data. So it wasn't until two years in, but, but let me tell you, the go slow to go fast. We spent a year and a half year in, in partnerships. We developed legal agreements in an MOU within six months. Once we hit the go button and said, let's do this, we had signatures from eight state department directors and data sharing agreements from the three biggest ones within six months. So that was why you go slow to go fast. You had the partners at the table and that has really worked. And let us ask hard questions of them and continue to ask hard questions as we move forward. So what's really cool is now our system is really infused in state government. Early Childhood Iowa, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that today, but, um, but invite me back for virtual coffee again some other time. I'd be happy to talk about Early Childhood Iowa, but I2D2 has become part of how ECI works now. It is key to the organizational structure here, right next to, right down from the governor's office to the state board, here's our integrated data system, really informing state work at the state level. Our state university partnership model really helps make sure that state agencies maintain control of their data. So we have a combination of the right people at the table and then built in processes throughout the way to ask questions, to figure out which data, to think about things over time. Um, one of the things that's been really important to us has been the build it as we use it model. And this is important from an equity perspective because we didn't do the kitchen sink version. You know, throw everything and give us all your sensitive data. You know, um, if you build it, they will come and all of a sudden it'll be useful, right? We didn't do it that way. We said, okay, what do we need right now? What's the relevant question right now? And do we need those data elements right now? And then we bring them in. And that's been, again, really helpful for building um, an IDS at the speed of trust. Um, so our governance approach has some standard protocols for project approvals and vetting. So again, back to this really understanding what and why piece, there's the key people at the table from the very beginning to be able to decide whether projects move forward. 
the legal agreements that we have in place articulate which data elements we can include and which data sets we can include and we prioritize things that we know are going to be relevant for the state so for example when we know our eci does an annual uh, report they do periodic needs assessments our federal mcv program which is a federal the federal home visiting program does needs assessments every couple of years we have different legislative reasons why data needs to be in there and we try to anticipate that when we write our legal agreement so we're ready to go and we have ongoing stakeholder engagement throughout the process works kind of like this now here this i benevolently stole this from john fantuzzo et al so amy's laughing but this is a total credit to them we slapped our name on it and he said go for it so we did um, but essentially we try to wrap around if this light blue is our internal data processes we have community advisory groups that have members of data contributing agencies wrapped around every project so that we can ask relevant questions at key points in time like when we're assessing data quality as it comes in hey why is this variable missing hey why don't we actually have child race on a birth record oh what does that mean? How do you how do you code that? What do you do with that? Um, when we're integrating data, we have people come back together at the table. Okay, it looks like these matched up, but these didn't match up. Does that does that seem to fit with how you think it should go according to what you know about your system? And then on the back end, before any data are shared out, we make sure that we have conversations with folks at the table to really interpret and discuss. Again, back to some of those equity principles. Um, we don't just want to analyze data by subgroups just to do it. But what does it mean? And what does it mean when you're analyzing things like school suspensions or child maltreatment or homelessness? Some of those highly racialized data sets that Amy was talking about. What does it mean when you break them down by race and then put it out there in the universe for people to act on, right? Acting on something that we know was formulated from a racialized place to begin with is very, very, um, uh, scary maybe so we want to make sure we have lots of conversations so that's what our our governance approach is really designed to do is to have really close conversations with data and policy people all throughout um, so that those that information gets shared in a really thoughtful way and even gets queried in a thoughtful way so now I want to hand off to my colleague Todd who's going to share with you some of those positive practices right so the AISP toolkit lays out challenging practices you might use a different word than that challenging practices and promising practices across different different ways of doing data integration and todd's going to walk you through some of those now all right so um basically i just kind of walk through uh one of the the key pieces of interest for me coming aboard with itd2 was this opportunity to take what a lot of people do use as that black box uh, package software that will link data together um, pretty simplistically in some cases, very complexly in other cases. But what we had or what was a selling feature for me was an opportunity to build something that, you know, personal knowledge, uh, something we can tune as we go and discover new things. Uh, so we've spent quite a bit of time coming up with uh, in algorithmic development that's kind of gone through different iterations as it's grown, but is now at a point where we have specifically attuned to limitations in the data we are integrating, uh, who's not there, particularly in certain data systems versus other data systems. Uh, and so when you're linking data, if you already know there are some people who aren't in one or more of those systems, you know, how do we then translate that to the analytic goals of a particular project and the conclusions we, we, we basically give to users of that data and the questions we're trying to answer. Who's running? Who's clicking? The slides. Bing. There we go, the old film strip. Bing. Uh, so uh, as Heather and Cass have mentioned, I've spent a a lot of my time deep down in the weeds on these kind of linking decisions, algorithms, uh, orders of operations, little things that we pick up uh, that seem to matter and other things that we, we sort of can bypass because we thought they would matter a lot and they didn't uh, in the data we have. So what we constantly, what I'm constantly doing in terms of building these 
linkage algorithms and sometimes project specific approaches to linking data systems is this balance between you know are we able to catch everybody we should be catching are we are we high enough on our similarity indexes uh, to be able to catch correct matches in messy data administrative data is messy uh, typos different ways of spelling people's names um, versus balancing that against the sensitivity to not force linkages. Um, are we still sensitive enough to pick up that two individuals, although their names are similar, or their in, the other demographic information is very similar, are in fact different people. So we're constantly trying to sit on that fence right there between the, what I would call a type one error or a you know, false positive, we matched the wrong kids, to the I two error or the false negative of we missed matches that should have occurred. And we try to, we, we, so everything we're doing is trying to balance that as best we can. These are just two examples of what we're dealing with in terms of administrative data where we have, like I said, different ways of spelling the same names uh, versus distinct individuals who have very similar records and making sure that we are in that space of catching the typos, but not believing all of them are typos. A simple way to put it. And click to the next time. There you go. Uh, so one of the first things I, I got to dive in too deep, and this was a fun week to 10 days of just playing with names and different things. Um, the metric that we use to index similarity and difference uh, or sensitivity uh, we have a bunch of choices. There's different sorts of methods. There's phonetic methods, uh, text similarity methods, text distance methods. And it quickly became apparent to us that uh, phonetic methods aren't really that sensitive to things. So this is an actual phonetic um, index called SoundX that gives you the exact same value for all of these names. Uh, clearly, that's uh, great for similarity, a, a horrible, horrible metric for trying to distinguish individuals who have very similar names. And this became even more of an issue uh, with different types of names, uh, particularly in the bottom right-hand table. When we started getting data in from systems that allowed Latin accented text, uh, SoundX won't even index those. Those aren't real letters, so you don't get any information. It becomes a useless um, metric at that point. So then we shifted our focus largely to similarity and distance metrics, and they differ with some distinction too. Uh, oftentimes they will identify the closest match if there is one, but then as you move through different sorts of changes between two text strings, you see that similarity distances and our similarity metrics and distance metrics start to hit differently on which is the next closest representation of that text string. Uh, so much so that we end up, if we just use one or the other, we could end up matching two different people to the same original ID or person in that first column on the left. So we did some work with that and decided we'd lean more heavily on distance metrics. They seem just a little more sensitive to minor differences in spellings versus the whole, what I would call wholesale differences in spellings. But then we also have the issue of deciding, well, where do we cut off the decision point? Uh, and that's kind of the bottom table is trying to get to that point where oftentimes you'll see an arbitrary set of a, a distance metric or a similarity metric has to exceed 0.9 to call that field a match. Um, we quickly realized that's not a good idea to just use a blind rule of thumb 0.9 in all instances. Uh, you lose a lot of information rather quickly. And it's really a challenge when you get into things like diminutive versions of names or nicknames. Uh, my first name is actually William. I've never used Bill, but Bill and William are not very similar phonetically text-wise or they're very distant from each other. Um, so setting the criteria at, at as high as 0.9 is a good idea in terms of sensitivity, but you do start to potentially miss people. So we've played a lot with those criteria as well. Click this next one. 
very quickly then, uh, it became apparent that we have to pay attention, not only for the quality of the work we're doing, but for real world applicability of what we're doing when we're linking data. And I started focusing in quite a bit on naming conventions. Uh, I've got some background with this from growing up, um, friends from different cultures, very uh, interested in naming conventions and things of that sort. And we quickly saw it. Um, it's not very rare uh, in our data systems to see what I call compounded names, whether those are first names, last names, or both, where there might be a hyphenated name. A person might actually have two first names that they use. And so that becomes interesting when you now have a data system that they don't show up under their full name in, or they show up under different parts of their name. How can you connect them? reasonably reliably. Uh, this becomes really apparent, particularly in uh, Hispanic and Latin cultures, where it is very common to include both a maiden name and a surname of the father. Sometimes that's even reversed in the order from, I grew up just north of the Mexico border, so it was always maiden surname. Um, but I am aware that there are some that flip them. And we start to see that. And so now we, we get a data system where we might get a full name that could be four, two first names, two last names, uh, a middle name might be thrown in there. And then we also then have a system where there's just a first name and one last name. How do we connect those kids? So we've employed procedures just generally to split name fields when we have that into multiple records. Um, and that works well typically for Eurocentric names, a hyphenated Smith Jones becomes Anna Smith on one line, Anna Jones on another. And if she's in that second data system under either of those last names, we should match her. But then this poses a little bit of a problem when you get into racial and ethnic conventions of naming. All of a sudden you start splitting name field and incorrectly matching somebody who's first name and first part of their last name is the same as somebody else's first name and second part of their last name. And this obviously then creates a problem with incorrect matching of the wrong individuals. Similarly, when we have cases where a first name and last name might be interchangeable in a particular language or culture, where it's not, I'm trying to think of a great example, Bob Frank in American Eurocentric culture, either of those could be a first name, but it could be a first and last name either way. So we started spending quite a bit of time on that, trying to catch in the bottom of this table is a perfect example of a naming convention uh, from some Middle Eastern countries where the first part of both of those last names, Abu is, is just son of Medal or son of Hassad. We don't want to accidentally match the wrong Nazim to the wrong last name. So we've started taking that into consideration in terms of our process. Next one. The last bit of this is relatively recent from one of our most recent uh, integration runs that we've done. We started looking at dates, birth dates. We don't just use names to match people. We typically require at least this much information more if we can get it. So we're looking at matching on date fields and name fields at the same time. We started seeing some interesting things with very unique names, uh, not to get too far down in the weeds, but your U probabilities in matching, right? The uniqueness of the name in a data set. But the birth dates being very similar, but transposed or in different orders. And it turns out uh, from a very Western Eurocentric uh, approach that not every country on earth expresses dates the same way we do. There is a prevalence for year, month, day, or month, day, year, but there are also regions and cultures where that's different. Day, month, year is more common than month, day, year. And we started seeing this, uh, not to a huge extent, but to enough of an extent where the, where the name fields are so unique, or we have additional information like a parent's name for each record, or a social security number for each record. And we start seeing these dates transpose, only the month and day transposing. It's possible those are data entry errors, 
but it could also be the case that whoever's entering the data might be from one of those cultures and enters them that way. Or it could be that the data are first submitted via a web portal or on paper by the parent who is transposing the dates. So we've started taking this into consideration, trying to build it into our system too. Let me just click for the next. So where we're at now with all of these pieces of information is we have a multiple pass approach when we link data. And we basically run through the first time with the original records as they are. Most of your matches will be exact. Uh, the largest proportion of the group that you match. We take those out and then we go through and run again using uh, just a text manipulation to remove all the spaces and name fields. String everybody's name together, first name, last name, middle name, whatever we're using. And we'll run through and do an exact match on that too. And that keeps us from potentially splitting these names into multiple rows and incorrectly matching De La Cruz to De La Sala because day matches day or la matches la. Uh, now we have to match the full string. Then our third pass through, we start doing some things with lowering cutoff criteria. We start around that 0.9 threshold I mentioned, but then we come down as low as 0.7 to pick up diminutive names. Uh, Lucas and Luke is, is my favorite one. 0.7, that's how close they are. And they're really only like one letter off. Uh, but it's enough of a change in our metrics to, we'd miss them. We would miss all of them. So when we go through and drop that cutoff, we might drop it on the first name field for whoever's left. But then we also raise the thresholds on the rest of the fields. So we require maybe an exact match on their birth year and birth month. Uh, while we have that the looser threshold on their first names. The key with all of this then is we're trying to come up with decision rules. When exactly do we, how far down do we go? What fields do we prioritize when we come down? And then dates are the most current thing we're dealing with. If there is a high level, which is kind of subjective right now, but a high level of uniqueness in the name field, do we trust that? Do we trust that it's a transposition of the month and day? And at the end of this, I spend a lot of my time at number six, human verification and rejection, combing through lines and lines and lines of records for the questionable ones, the ones that we're not sure we should call a match or the ones that we're pretty convinced are based on some other piece of information we have. Next slide, my last one, I think. And so this is uh, where we kind of end up uh, briefly. It's just a map of match rates from one of our most recent integrations. And the key point of all this is not to get bogged down in it, but that we have areas where we don't do as good of a job matching kids as we do in other areas. And from an equity perspective, we suspect that some of this is due to migration in and out of the state uh, versus stability in particularly like the central and southern central parts of the state where our match rates are 94%, nobody goes anywhere. So this is a, just an example of the next step once we get through an integration, it's only the first step in now translating that equity model, that, that attentiveness to, are we missing kids we shouldn't be missing? Are they not in the systems because those systems are in some sense racialized here in Iowa? Uh, not a lot of our, you know, we're a pretty homogenous state when it comes to birth records, um, less so for education uh, records. By kindergarten, we have a little bit more diversity. So we know that there are some kids we're never gonna link in those two systems because the child wasn't born here, but attending kindergarten here. So as we get done with an integration, we start to consider this and we, we carry this idea all the way through all of our analytics. Once we have questions to answer and are moving forward, we have to be careful always about who's not here that we're not catching. Can we go far enough down and still make a valid inference to some of our really small groups? If we can't, caveats that what we're saying omits those people. Um, and I, I think we do a pretty good job at stringing that guiding principle all the way through to the final delivery of what we're telling our stakeholders and partners at the end of it. And here's what we can tell you based on what we have, but realize we don't have everything. 
next one? No, I think I am done. So yes, I am finished today. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Heather. Um, okay, so this is really great, and I appreciate all of the work that you guys have done. And now I, I get to grill you a little bit on questions that I think about as we go through this process. Um, but in kind of as we're ending on that last map about how well do we match and what's because of migration and what isn't, you know, the reason we care, Amy earlier today made the comment that this, the infrastructure, the data infrastructure is the infrastructure issue of our decade. And I'll tell you, Amy is the third passionate, articulate person who has made that comment to me in the last month, because this is real. This is something that lots of us are starting to understand that, you know, infrastructure was developed in the prior years. And if you don't know the literature behind it, maybe you've seen the show Cars, which I watched with my children back in the day, which is, you know, like, oh, no, now this town's not on the highway and all the people could come. Right. And that's what we're worried about doing with our data. So when Todd shows you those match rates, that's why we're going into that more to say, are we are we missing people? Is it that they just moved and then we shouldn't have matched them? Right. Or is there something about the way that we match that's silencing the voices of the people who need to be heard? And that's the reason that we care so much and we think so much about this issue. And and we've met every week for the last 18 months thinking about this issue and how do we address it and how do we do it. And I will say as a plug that if you are a data scientist thinking about doing integration work, you know, when we took those off the shelf algorithms, those match rates were much worse. So this long process, Todd said, oh, it's six steps, but really it's like 12. It's just looks nice when you describe it as six. When we started it based on the original sort of off the shelf algorithm, it was only a two step process. And we have refined and refined it around these kind of cultural nuances that we've been able to establish so we can make sure that we're targeting these groups. And I would encourage all of you to do it. But my first question to the team is, why did you start thinking this matters? So I'm gonna be more specific. I'm gonna start with Amy. And Amy, my question to you is, from your experience as sort of this integrated data entrepreneur, I think about all of your work, you know, I knew you before you came onto AISP, AISP um, and that work in Charlotte was phenomenal. Why? What drove you to take on these issues? You've been doing racial equity from the time you were a teacher. What made you think that this is the area that you were going to be focusing on for a long time? Uh, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it, again, is context. Like we, I mean, it sounds like Todd was really influenced by growing up near the border, right? And I was really influenced by um, living in a community that is incredibly racially diverse with a high percentage, like a, we are a plurality community in Charlotte Mecklenburg. We don't have a majority of any racial or ethnic group. Um, whites have not been the majority here since 2014 um, and um, non-Hispanic whites. And, um, and we've always been very diverse. So I also went to intentionally desegregated schools growing up. I went to a very diverse high college. So I, I think issues of race have always been forefront to me because I've been you know, immersed in it. Um, and I'll say teaching fundamentally shifted me. I um, didn't, I wasn't trained in teaching. I was actually um, a sociology major and Africana studies and women's studies major in undergrad and then went into teaching. And so I had like these sociological constructs deeply embedded in my consciousness, but then it applied through education and it was just, it was, um, it was radical, right? Um, and then that influenced my research and then that influenced what data you need. And then you see all the pieces connect, right? So I would say that's how I emerged here. Um, and I, and I think my experience is a really good plug for when you are building teams around data integration, please, please, please focus on training. Like, please pull in a sociologist, please pull in a psychologist, please pull in um, someone who has agency experience. Um, like I knew how dirty data was at the school level because I was a school administrator and like I entered data and I knew how bad I was at it after working a 10 hour day. And then I went in to put discipline data in and realizing how many keystroke errors I probably did and how you know many fields I refused to click on if they weren't forced. 
Um, <laughs> so it was that, that like lived experience. And then I go and I look at these data sets and I'm like, this is garbage. Who's using this? And they're like, oh, they're making like, staffing decisions based on this data they're making policy decisions they're making funding decisions that they're making like huge decisions and i'm like but i entered this data it's crap um so i think all of that fed into where we are here 20 years later <laughs> awesome thank you amy heather i'm going to ask you a really similar question which is you know you've had all these experiences sort of growing these integrated data systems and that could have led you to a lot of different paths but you've been very interested in this racial equity piece and in integrated data and i wonder did you have an aha moment or was that just part of your training all the way through yeah um i don't know that it was specifically part of training but there has been this um i don't know um my parents will call it the angry teenager that just decided to never grow up in the things that you see that are not fair right and I grew up in Iowa. So I lived for 18 years in one of those small towns on that map that you just saw, um, surrounded by white people, surrounded by white Christian people, um, surrounded by white middle class, you know, growing up on the farms people. Um, and I went to Philadelphia at 18. And I thought I was ready for that, right? I was ready to try something and ready to go. And West Philadelphia, um, is not middle of Iowa. Um, and I saw a lot of things and I experienced a lot of things and I knew what injustice was, but I didn't really get it until I got there. And I thought, these are their elementary schools in America. Um, these are their books. These are their neighborhoods. These really. And um, so I don't know. I, I thought I wanted to be a clinical psychologist to start out. You know, I was going to help people. Right? I was going to help people with psychology and I uh, quickly got very frustrated with the one on one and slowly um, worked my way up into systems and realizing we needed to fix the systems and the policies and the programs and the best way I could figure out how to do that was to understand data and to use data and to um, yeah, to, to use data for that. And I think that again, kind of like we've joked about this a little bit today, you know, if you've seen one data system, you've seen one data system and they're all really messy in their own ways. And um, I think going from Philadelphia then to Arkansas, Rich, like, so, so you think about some of the challenges with racial segregation in Arkansas and the Little Rock Nine and school desegregation and some of those issues. Um, I, I saw a lot of that in a very different way and trying to talk about health policy in the middle of the Affordable Care Act and should we expand Medicaid or not and who's that going to serve in the Mississippi Delta and what does that look like and um, it just there's just a lot of it's not fair and I just think you know we're um, and I know I can't see a lot of your faces but I'm going to call us all out anyway we're privileged by the fact that we're here period and we can just do better and so I think that that's just where my passion is now is like and I can do better on data. I think, you know, we can do better on data and we can collect better data and we can use data more smartly. So it's like, I love working with people like Todd that can go down into the weeds so deep that half the time I can't even find him down there. And, but it's really fun because when he finally comes out, there's like gold coming out of that thing, you know? So it's, it's fun um, and for a purpose. Awesome, thank you very much. Todd, we're going to turn to you next. And, you know, you and I have had so many conversations about trying to think about how can we be more equitable in the way that we integrate. And one thing that I'm constantly impressed with, I mean, regularly, I would say that just comes up over and over again is you'll make these nuanced cultural statements like, well, you know, this is, we're integrating this way and there are these sort of matches and we need to be careful because, you know, this group might match in this way and this group might match in this way and you've done a lot of thinking and reading and processing around why racial equity matters and and how that needs to be like actually transformed into data actions which i've never worked with anyone who is as thoughtful as you are on these issues so where did that come from todd where 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 did you learn that that's amazing so i think my, my case is probably a little bit of the opposite of what Heather was just describing. Uh, I got to Iowa and went, where are all the people at? Um, we, I, much like Amy's situation, I, I grew up 
uh, about an hour away from Los Angeles, literally two hours from Tijuana. Um, there wasn't, at least I don't remember, a, a dominant ethnic group. It was everybody. And what was really key for me growing up personally was the, the buckets don't work. Um, there's a big difference between Mexican people and Honduran people. Uh, they're not all Latinos. They are, as we call them, or as some group to put them in. But we had the same issue with Asian cultures. Um, there's a distinction between Japanese people and Laotians. So we were always sort of aware of that. The, the, it, you can't, everybody doesn't fit in the same bucket. Um, Saturday morning is different at that house than it is at this house, even though it, it looks the same. Uh, so I was always aware of that. When we got to Iowa, it was it was kind of surprising in terms of the homogeneity that's here. Not as obvious when you're in one of our more urban areas, Des Moines, Ames, the universities here, uh, Iowa City. But as soon as you get out, you know, we're talking 20 miles out, there's nothing. Uh, the diversity is almost zero in some places. So it, it's always... And it was kind of, this is a thing you live in, a context you live in. Now that context is kind of gone. And it immediately became clear from a professional standpoint that, you know, anything you do. Uh, I was a psychologist. I guess I still am. I'm a social psychologist. Uh, theory testing. You know, the only reason you test theories is to find boundary conditions. Who doesn't the theory apply to? Well, as soon as you start talking about policy decisions and real rules, laws, how we're going to distribute resources, you have to pay attention to the 1.3% of people in this group, the 0.7% of people in that group. And so one of the common questions I hear in a lot of these data science kinds of things is, you know, is it worth the time you spend to match an additional 25 people? Yes, if it's the 25 people in a particular group where there's only 75 of them in the data system. Um, I don't think anybody would ever ask about it. Is it okay to ignore one third of the population? It's not. So that's, that's where it's always on, on my mind um, in terms of whatever we're doing is already somewhat short-sighted because of our specific context, but it would always be that way, no matter what the context was, it would just be different distributions of people. And so the key for me is if you're going to take data, do something with data and provide that data as essentially a product that somebody's going to use <clears throat> to make decisions from, you've got to attend to this stuff. You have to be doing the most you can reasonably to not shortchange people, um, not to, to just skip over them. Uh, and not to make mistakes. The bigger concern, I think, is, is the mistake of, of inaccurate conclusions versus no conclusions, I think, are worse. Um, so my key being there is that I understand we're going to miss some people, uh, but I'm probably over the fence a little on the other side of linking the wrong people together in terms of data quality and decision making. Awesome. Thank you. And now I'm going to take us to a totally different way. You know, Chris is probably listening to this and thinking, oh, I wish this were my problem. Because here is this first three people we chatted with who are using linked administrative data, and you get to actually see all this information and choose what you go to. And Chris then is given this federal data where all of these counts are suppressed before he even has it, and he's asked to put this together and package it nicely and give it to decision makers in Iowa, but he doesn't have access to that underlying data. And he has all these restrictions about what data he can he can share because of privacy. Now, I'm going to say two things, Chris, before I ask my question. One is, um, I was recently trying to get a legal agreement, and the state agency that I was working with said, okay, so you'll follow all our rules. And basically, if you do, and they told me your product, you know, the indicators portal, if you basically follow their rules, you're going to be fine. Can you follow their rules? I said, yeah, we'll follow, we'll follow Chris Seeger's rules, and we will you know, now meet your justification. So you do in many ways set the standard with what you're doing. On the other hand, that must be incredibly frustrating um, because I have also been around when people say, they're in my second point, which is people say, oh my gosh, I can't get the information I need for this county. I can't get the information I need for this place um, because of all these privacy restrictions. 
So Chris, my question to you is how is this issue of racial representativeness in data, especially in rural places, how is it important to the work that you do? How, how does it feed into those considerations when you're using the work after it's been kind of published publicly? Well, it's um, extremely difficult because, okay, so we work with a lot of extension professionals and we get requests for data. We've produced this nice product, which is easily digestible. And that's the whole point. We're trying, trying to get data into the public's hands. Um, and I, I am not naive enough to think that our product is quite to the point that it's easily accessible to everyone. Um, I know that because we produce it digitally, it does not meet accessibility standards yet because it's 100% dynamic. The technology is catching up, we're watching it, but it's not there yet. It actually produces more errors than not. So we really don't wanna produce an accessible document that actually tells you, no, there's not 10% of the people there, there's 110%, you know what I mean? Um, so we have that caveat we're working with. But when it comes to um, presentation in a county, you know, think about Southwest Iowa, um, some of these counties to begin with only have less, have less than 5,000 people to begin with. And that's the county data center. And they expect that we can tell, we go to the, the federal data that we have and it's just a bunch of nulls because they can't tell us the three people that's there. I mean, and here's the other thing, it's not even just people, it's livestock, it's crops, it's all kinds of stuff. When we get to these rural counties and communities, we can't do anything because there's just, the, the data does exist, but we can't get to it. Um, case in point, this week we're working on preparing some stuff that, um, for the summer DSPG program that deals with uh, workforce. And my colleague has a data set and she said, I'm a little bit tied down though, because she goes, we can analyze it as much as we want at a certain, at a fine grain level, but we can't publish any of it because we cannot publish anything at a finer grain than what they produce, which is county. But yet we know all this rich data exists below it. And it doesn't matter if we get a data agreement. None of that matters. The rule is set in stone. They have the power of being able to do the finest grain of detail. There's no around it. And so that's tough because some of our, our law of our clientele doesn't understand that. That when you tell them, well, there is no data that we can share they don't recognize that that's a federal issue, a privacy issue. They just see it as you guys don't know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> you know, um, and it's hard, hard to explain because what ha the other thing that makes it really tough is they've seen, they'll say, well, I saw it in the newspaper or on the news, they showed us that the number of, um, Latinos, I, I'm not even gonna pick a group, okay. Number of race group, uninsured, over the age of 50 in this county is 72%. And that's what they see in the news, okay? Great, what the media didn't tell you is that was plus or minus 50%. And the MOE is huge. I mean, you see this all the time in the media. Um, and they just don't have an idea what the MOE is. We do have standards um, with our group on what level of MOE we accept. We like to produce stuff that shows the MOE with it. In fact, um, uh, Liesl Ethington, one of my colleagues here at Iowa State actually just produced a really great Tableau um, demonstration uh, dashboard for us this week to use internally and with our DSPG group this summer that shows just how badly you can represent data if you say, eh, MOEs don't matter. Um, and pretty cool because we got one example that shows the whole map of Iowa. It's the exact same color. There's no variation in it. Because if you set the, if you set the um, point at just the right area on this data set, there's no difference. And that's all they show on a map. I mean, it's just all the same color. Ah, we're all the same. Okay. So yeah, it's a real problem. Uh, what happens is we end up having, I mean, it's not just, yeah. Rural data is tough. And so when we look at, we look, we talk about race groups um, often and areas, uh, you know, who's got privilege and doesn't have privilege. I think privilege is different. Also, that's something we have to recognize. There's privilege to different things, you know? There's, for sure, there's certain privileges in rural areas. One of the privileges not in rural areas is terrible infrastructure data, as someone who works with that, um, and just general data 
of change in those communities. It's hard. So it's hard to make decisions when you can't see the data to give you proper, you to properly inform you. And so we're gonna be dealing with a bunch of that this summer, the data science public good program. Um, and it's gonna be quite exciting to see where we get. A lot of it comes down to, can you find alternative forms of data, of, uh, alternative data sources to help inform and fill in those gaps? And that's not an easy thing and it's a whole nother topic for later date. Thank you. I will say, I just wanna close in on this and say, I'm, I'm part of a um, discussion group that's been meeting, um, about the new infrastructure bill that's going through the Senate and thinking about, um, you know, one, the, the person that's wrangling us together is, um, works to provide resources for senators as they're making this decision. And they understand that the rural infrastructure is terribly difficult. But what we also have to think about is we're thinking about equity. I think this is going to be something we will be talking about for a decade. So you are all here to think about it and noodle on it with us is, when we don't provide the data, and I agree, huge problems. I don't have the answer. I don't know how we do it. But are we doing this thing where we're leaving important people out of the discussion? You know, when the first differential privacy estimates came out of the out of census, 70% of American Indians were dropped from their estimates in the US. I mean, they've redone them because obviously that's a big problem. But as we're thinking about these issues with equity and with data and with privacy, it gets really tricky on the back end too. And so I've been hearing very, very interesting people and their arguments are getting louder and stronger. So we'll watch this come out over the next few years. In the meantime, thank you everybody. This was really, really interesting, very helpful. And I appreciate everyone who was here and who took the time. And those of you who are gonna be watching this on YouTube later, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Chris. You guys are awesome. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful the afternoon. The answer to the question earlier is you can connect to JSON files, but you cannot connect directly to shape files on GitHub for the person that asked if you're still here. Oh, I think that was Saul. Is he still here? Oh, yep. There you go. Okay. Chris. Well, we can talk more about Saul in a week. Okay. All right. You got stumped and now he came back with the answer. Awesome. Great to see you all. Have a wonderful day.